Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And since a number of you have urged me to do so, today we're going to talk about the Fujifilm X-Pro2. But before we do, I want to let you know that we've just created a Patreon page and invite you to join us by becoming a patron of the work we do here at Three Blind Men and an Elephant for as little as a couple of bucks a month. Or more. At the end of the show, I'll go into more detail, but in the meantime, you can always go to www.patreon.com slash Hugh Brownstone to learn more. Okay, so after a quick email exchange with Fujifilm, a $1,700 X-Pro2, along with the trio of 23, 35, and 50 millimeter F2s, known and loved by some as Fujicrons in an informal nod to like his nomenclature, arrived here at the Batcave. So, uh, Fuji guys, thank you. That is a non-gender specific term of endearment. I want to keep this short because I don't want to cover ground that's been covered elsewhere, especially given that the camera has been out for just about two and a half years. I'll do the best that I can. For those of you completely unfamiliar with the 35mm rangefinder inspired X-Pro2. I'll put links in the show notes down below to my own review of its fraternal twin, the Fuji X-T2, which I love, and from which you can glean much about the X-Pro2 and Fujifilm lens ecosystem, as well as a link to, and I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing this properly, Martin Heilbronn's excellent and very detailed of the X-Pro2. Let's cut to the proverbial chase. The X-Pro2 is one of the cleverest, most inspired attempts, most successful attempts I've seen at melding tradition with modernity. But of course, that's hardly the entire story. First, though I shouldn't have been surprised, and it may not surprise you, the imagery coming out of this system is gorgeous compared to even the newest cameras. Like this. Second, the signature feature of the X-Pro2, the thing that truly sets it apart, that is the rangefinder-inspired yet au courant hybrid optoelectronic viewfinder, stunned me when I realized it's not an actual rangefinder. And then stunned me again by how it did work, reminding me of nothing so much as, well, the 90s era Contax G2. This, to me, ends up being the defining fulcrum in your purchase decision. Hold that thought. Third. The set of F2 Fujicrons, in fact, Fujifilm's entire APS-C coverage lens line, is arguably the best and most complete crop sensor line in the business, from image and build quality to price range, primes, zooms, and maximum apertures. The Crons are uniquely compact, lightweight, water-resistant, crisp, tasty, render color beautifully, provide all but the shallowest depth of field, and are very reasonably priced if not the same build quality as my two favorites in the line, the 16mm f1.4 and 56mm f1.2. There's actually not much more to say about that. Fourth, for me, the ergos of the X-Pro2 are close, but not quite as appealing as those of the X-T2, principally in terms of the fixed rear LCD panel and the cascading set of effects brought on by the left side viewfinder, namely the elimination of the dedicated ISO dial and its relocation of the function to the shutter speed dial, reminding me of nothing so much as my very first SLR, the Canon FTQL. Uh, usable, better than in a menu or programmable function button, but not as nice as the X-T2's dedicated dial, though to be fair, back then when I had the FTQL, you'd set the ISO once per emulsion and then forget about it until you switched. And the elimination altogether of the X-T2's metering mode and drive collars co-located with the shutter speed and ISO dials, respectively. Fifth, it's fascinating to contemplate 
how little the X-Pro2 with its excellent 24 megapixel APS-C sensor and native mount glass give up to any camera, beginning with Leica's own full-frame 24 megapixel M cameras and Summicron M lenses from which Fujifilm took its inspiration. Let's consider just three metrics, price, depth of field, and what you see with your own eyes. The cheapest Leica M, new, with a set of three Summicron M's will set you back between four and six times the price of the Fuji kit using the cheapest M body currently available new, the Type 262. I'm talking starting at almost $15,000 versus well under $4,000 for the Fuji kit. Yet the x 2 offers autofocus and an optical three magnification viewfinder with multiple digital manual focus assists or full EVF that the Leica M Type 262 does not. Which of course, begs the question, what does the Leica M, with its legendary lenses, offer a rangefinder shooter that the X-Pro2 and its outstanding lens ecosystem does not? Hold that thought as we continue to the difference in depth of field. Now, guess what? It turns out that the difference in depth of field between a wide-open Summicron 75mm f2 on the full-frame type 262 and that of a wide-open Fuji 50mm f2 on an APS-C X-Pro2, say for a headshot, is a third of an inch at three feet. For wide-angle shots, this is even less of an issue, as in, it's not. Conversely, remember, too, that with one extra stop of light when you want depth of field equivalence at all but the widest aperture, you'll be shooting at half the ISO on the Fuji. As for what you can see with your own eyes, well, the Fuji film simulations are a singular joy in this ever increasingly techno gibberishly inclined industry of ours, and image quality is stellar. As in this real world example, since colors can be tweaked in post the way noise, tonality, resolution, and sharpness cannot, even at six inches, the 27 by 40 inch print hanging on our wall at home, taken with the X Pro 2's kissing cousin, the XT2, appears grainless, noiseless, with wonderfully rich tonality. It reminds me of nothing so much as medium format. And this is a JPEG shot with Fuji's outstanding Across film simulation and their equally outstanding 16mm f1.4. Which begs these questions. How big do you want to print or display? How far away from the image will your intended audience view it? How much do you intend to crop the image? Because you didn't have the right lens or your composition was otherwise too compromised. Because cropping aside, and I have no problem with cropping, I mean two of my favorite images of all time, my yeah, number one and number two, Arnold Newman's portrait of Igor Stravinsky and Henri Cartier-Bresson's Saint-Lazare were both cropped. Only if you pixel peep at what I'll argue are inappropriately close distances, that is, at which point the gestalt of the image is simply gone from your field of view and means either the image itself fails aesthetically, emotionally, intellectually, or any combination thereof, or you're viewing technically rather than artistically. 24 megapixels is all that 99.9% .9 of us need 99.9% .9 of the time, roughly. But to return to value for a moment, on the other hand, the X-Pro2 is one and a half times the price of the X-T2 these days, which has a flippy screen and 4K video recording the X-Pro2 does not, and is the same price as Fuji's latest flagship, the X-H1, which has the added benefits beyond 4K video and flippy screen of in-body image stabilization, strengthened lens mount, better EVF, uh, and the sub-LCD panel if you want that kind of thing. I'll figure that out shortly. Though, at the expense of weight and size. The X-H1's nearest competitors, Panasonic's G9 and Sony's a7 III, also deserve mention anywhere near this price. The $100 cheaper, 20 megapixel micro four thirds G9 offers very solid ergonomics, outstanding 4K video and IBIS, an enormous lens ecosystem, fully articulating rear LCD, and a vastly superior EVF with significant real-world benefit at 3.7 million dots, 0.83 magnification, variable down for glasses wear, versus the X-Pro2's 2.4 million dot, 0.59 magnification, full-time EVF. 
the $300 more expensive 24 megapixel full frame A7 III has ergonomics only a mother could love, but it also offers IBIS 4K video, which is outstanding, superb lens light, and superior autofocus, dynamic range, and low light performance at the margin, which is an important qualifier because the Fujis are outstanding at anything less than 10 tenths. The X-Pro2 is 40% dearer than what is arguably its truest, closest competitors, the EVF-only Panasonic GX8 and Sony A6500, though a little bit further down the price chain, you'll find, again, the EVF-only rangefinder form factor Panasonic GX9 and Sony A6300, both of which are great cameras selling for under a grand, though the A6300 doesn't offer IBIS, so maybe that's an even closer competitor to the X-Pro2. I know there's also the Olympus Pen F, but since I've never gone hands-on with one, I can't really comment. Then again, if you're truly old school and prefer actual film, you can find a Contax G2 on eBay with a three-lanes version of the Summicrons for about the same price as the X-Pro2 body new alone. Which in turn begs the question, at whom is the X-Pro2 targeted? Do you even care that I just spoke about video? Well, okay, right, of course. It's aimed at rangefinder fans, people who want rangefinder handling, people who want physical controls, people who value the optical viewfinder experience and its advantages of dynamic range limited only by our own human eyes, at least while you're composing and focusing, being able to see just outside the frame to better capture perhaps that decisive moment for which rangefinders are forever linked. And maybe for people like me who are both right eye dominant and centrally proboscis challenged. Maybe it's aimed at like a rangefinder fans constrained by budget or a decision process, shall we say, weighted toward value, whether they can afford it or not. Or, like the fans who want the feel of a traditional rangefinder with the convenience and higher hit rate of autofocus lenses. And I hear you. At which point, perhaps a more apt Leica comparison would be the 24 megapixel APS-C censored CL or TL2 with their relatively reasonably priced, that is relative to the manual focus M lenses anyway, autofocus TL lenses, of course. Again, I'll put a link in the show notes down below so you can check out my review of both of those cameras. In any event, in the end, we can say that the X-Pro2 is for people who pay close attention not just to image quality, but the quality of taking the image, especially, predominantly, stills. The Singular issue for me then, the fulcrum point I spoke of earlier, is that the X-Pro2's greatest strength, its optoelectronic viewfinder, just might also be its greatest weakness. And the basis for one of four things the Leica M provides that the X-Pro2 doesn't. So you don't have to hold that thought any longer. Let's go through them. One, the M in my book has a superior optical finder. If you are so constituted, there is a joy in composing and focusing using rangefinder technology of which the optical viewfinder itself is only one part. That part, as I said, is being able to see movement just outside of the frame and thus better prepared for when that moment arrives in frame. In this the Leica M and Fuji X-Pro2 are conceptually no different, but the M's viewfinder is significantly larger, and that makes it much better, for me anyway. Even if the M has worse eye relief, no built-in dioptric adjustment, although I have astigmatism, so this doesn't really matter to me, I have to use my glasses, none of the digitally superimposed information that so many of us have come to expect over the years, from ISO to aperture, shutter speed, metering mode, and in the Fuji X-Pro2 focusing distance scale, which I really appreciate, and does not offer Fuji's wonderfully clever internally switching viewfinder corrective lenses that slide into place when you attach the 23mm for a wider field of view that you can see, or when you want critical manual focus without the EVF patch and zoom in optically, and give you focus peaking to boot as it switches into EVF, which 
are not small things. The second part of that joy comes from the optical and physical process of using an actual rangefinder, which the M not only has but pioneered, while the X-Pro2 does not and did not. For some of us, there is something extraordinarily gratifying about turning the focus ring on a full manual lens, even moving oneself backward or forward at, say, minimum focusing distance and seeing those two images snap into one. As I just said, the X-Pro2 doesn't have this. But what it does have is fascinating. Because while you don't have a true rangefinder and the crons are fly-by-wire, you do have that optical magnification and then that further punch into the EVF with peaking. This is very, very clever and works very, very well. On the other hand, what I think maybe you could say is too clever by half and doesn't work very well, for me, again, anyway, is the option of turning on a small EVF patch within the optical frame in the lower right corner. It adds complexity, pulls me away from the action occurring in the rest of the frame, and is really small, making it difficult to nail focus. Two, the M has superior build quality and industrial design. Not surprising. Again, if you are so constituted, there is a joy that comes from using a tool with the very highest mechanical precision, silkiest movement, and cleanest design. Now, the Fuji is no slouch, but the M is in an entirely different league from switch gear to the twist of a true manual focus lens with hard stops and real aperture rings on the lens barrel and everything in between, including a body that feels like it's machined from a single block of granite. as you would hope, given the price differential, though, again, it may not matter to you, and that's fine. Three, the M is simpler to use, not only because of the industrial design, which harkens back to 1954 and is retained to this day, but by the current team's commitment to pair the number of decisions and choices to what is essential rather than what is possible. This is true from physical controls to software. Four, the M offers a story in its heritage and the process by which it is built even today that the Fuji does not. Yes, generally speaking, modern rangefinder style cameras, of which the X-Pro2 is the most daringly conceived, uniquely and thoroughly designed example, at some level trade on the history of mid-century rangefinders. But neither Fuji nor anyone else can point to legendary works by legendary photographers and legendary craftsmanship even today the way like it can. These last three points are not criticisms of Fuji, nor excuses for Leica pricing, but instead what I said earlier, the things that the M offers which the Fuji does not. To people for whom these things matter, these are significant differentiators. Whether they can afford to purchase an M is a separate issue, as are aesthetic differences in image quality. They are both Excellent. Full stop. Yeah, I could go on for days, but right about now my head hurts. I think I smell smoke. And I'm getting hungry, so let's wrap this up. Um, truly, to Fujifilm's great credit, as I said at the beginning, the X-Pro2 is one of the cleverest, most inspired, and most successful attempts I've seen at melding tradition with modernity for its intended audience at the price with integrated autofocus, which... It dawns on me, I don't think I've mentioned, is excellent, especially for single-shot stills. The uh, Expert 2 is peerless. I really, now, understand why Expert 2 fans are so passionate about it. In the end, though, I think it boils down to this. If you want, call it a nine-tenths Leica M experience in terms of image quality and handling for one quarter the price. With autofocus and other modern capabilities and lenses, the Fuji lens line is more extensive than the M's. The X-Pro2 should be at the top of your list. With this set, however, if you are a devotee of true rangefinder focusing or 10 tenths build quality, heritage and simplicity, it shouldn't. And if neither of these profiles describe you, that's fine. There are 
better options out there. That's it. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below. You guys continue to be just incredible, knowledgeable, inspiring, funny. I mean, you're a joy, truly. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Grab one or both of our new Hold That Thought t-shirts you wanted us to put up at our new 3bmeptthreadless.com store. Support our work by using our affiliate links down below in the show notes, dropping us coffee money via our PayPal link down below in the show notes, or even better than that, we invite you to become a patron of our work over at Patreon. Link down below. We've created our Patreon page because we are stoked to bring you not only gear reviews, but with our What Were You Thinking and Good World Gone Bad series, historical, educational, artistic morsels, and longer form conversations, not interviews, with world-class photographers, curators, gallery owners, keepers of the legacy, folks like Elliot Erwitt, Anya Sear, Mark Lubell, Ethelene Staley, and friends like Brian Smith, Paul Giroux, Nino Rakicevich, and more. We'd really like you to join us to deliver this kind of content regularly. Your support on Patreon will really help us ramp it up. In which case, as always, we thank you for it. That's it. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.